<laughs> it's podcast 13, so it should totally be a disaster. Oh, okay. So let's see if we can bring, break this. We're going we're gonna <laughs> to okay. break uh, like thousands of years of superstition. Number 13, is it going to be lucky or is this going to die in its arse? You, listener, just, you decide. <laughs> just wait till I start eating my salt and vinegar. Wait, crisps, right? That's what you said? Yeah, he's learning. The, the thing, we're just going to get straight into this. The thing I love about Evan, right? See, when he comes to the UK, he adopts UK words. So he'll start saying like, hey, you wanker. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I know you don't say that. <laughs> I had to get a prep on what wanker meant, but I know what crisps mean. So welcome. <laughs> welcome. I think the dear listener, you should understand this is day five of a Doug, Doug and Evan uh, bender at New Art Aberdeen. Right now, just to set the scene, we are currently sitting in a rotating table in the back of a hotel covered in like <laughs> sort of. I don't know, it just looks like a a love nest. There's a tea set right here. There's a tea set and then just like shiny dangling glitter balls uh, that look like it could have been from a party about, I don't know, maybe 14 years ago. (laughs) And they just sort of thought, oh, it looks good. We'll just leave it there. Um, The party kept going. So we're here in this little love nest in Aberdeen. Of course, we're here for Noir Aberdeen. The tail end. So how was your experience with Noir Aberdeen? I feel like year three of Newark Aberdeen, it seems as if the locals seem to be kind of in full throttle liking it. Almost like, it's almost too positive. It was like really, really great. I mean, and I think Newark's doing a better job of integrating uh, more activities that kind of incorporate more people this year. Uh, so it, it's it's kind of weird because you know how you, you and I are around street art things often and there's a lot of jaded behavior, mm. jaded attitude. And like this just doesn't have it. This town doesn't have a jaded vibe at all. And I think any of those pre preconception or, or kind of like those uh, that like maybe a little nerve um, from the locals as to what this impact would have on their city. Um, I think they've started to kind of that started to subside somewhat because like you say, they, they are all so positive about this and I, I i've said this before and i 100 percent believe this is reinforced again this year i i've never seen a local reaction like the aberdonians take to new art yeah and okay so because you you go to i think you go to a little bit more street art festivals than i do does that reflect on the artists you think more what do you mean do I, because of the artist selection no or? no no do, I, do the artists kind of feel it can you tell the artists are feeling? Definitely. I think so too. I totally Definitely. think like all the artists are like, kind of surprised. Like, I'm interested to see where this goes because it's like there's no way that like because at the moment it's contracted till 2020. Effectively, next year is the last year. But right. I don't think you know. It's like once you've seen this, how do you take this yeah. away? Yeah. So it's like you know you can't bring something that just suddenly becomes so embedded into the culture, the the calendar of the local people here, and then just snap it back. But then you've got these restrictions and problems that are just purely physical, down yeah. to architecture, down to space, down to the, the where can you take over? What it does too, at least it seems like here in the last three years, is that it makes like the town people who are already creatives like feel like more empowered, which seems kind of like a good thing too. That's definitely one of the biggest things I've noticed. You see so much more uh, non-new art based artwork up on the walls. Yeah, it's so, I mean, it's the way it's supposed to be. So it, it I don't know, it just seems like it's really good. And then like, and then when you're hosted really well, you go to pubs and everything, and like it's just like the vibe is so good, and then like the whiskey, <laughs> the whiskey tastes a little bit better. Like everything just kind of seems like it's on point. And I've had plenty of all of that this week. It's there's been, so been a, there's been a fair amount there's of been that. Been a fair amount. And I fucking lost Fight Club this year. If viewers, if you don't know, listeners, excuse me, if you don't know, every year with New Art there is a pub debate called Fight Club where two sides argue. Almost the same point, <laughs> uh, but a kind of a critical sort of analysis of street art. And I, I've been a big winner in Norway, and I was a big loser here. I've been a loser here a couple of years now. Just to give you an idea of how badly Evan lost, the opposition made a case defending uh, pedophilia. And even though that happened, Evan yeah. lost. <laughs> Pedophilia for those of us in America. Oh, who, sorry. But uh, New Art has a really, really nice academic portion in a, a conference where there's a lot of great people from around the world talking about different matters of urban art and urban intervention. And the conversation with Axel Void that I had 
I thought was a really good uh, a barometer of where like street art kind of is. And I thought he did a really good do- good job of articulating kind of his position in it. Um, and I know we've talked to him before, um, but it was nice to talk to him in this environment. And you have to talk to Vils, who's one of like the you know the big superstars of um, so so um, street art. Wait, wait, let's stay on Axel for a second. Um, yeah. I guess we're gonna play you at least a, a, either the whole conversation or or a section of the the conversation. Yeah, he was, in, he was, he was brilliant. He was really great. Um, so just to give us an idea, uh, what what was your discussion? What was the? Did you have a, a theme that you wanted to uh, to talk about before? Or was it just kind of like, look, tell me about your, tell me about you. It was funny. We prepped like beforehand, and you prep. He gets prep. We never get prep. <laughs> we 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 we've never prepped once. He and I prepped for an hour. We did a whole like, conversation. We didn't talk about anything that we prepped about, which was great. Cause that like when we got up there, we, everything changed. Like, okay. You know, we talked about the mural that he did here. Mural roles he did too, and sort of the idea of taking kind of some found memories and. Um, Re, you know, reconstructing them for a modern audience, and um, I like the way he talked about coming to a city he's never been to before and sort of uh, executing something. I like the idea he talked about empathy and the ideas of empathy around his work. I like he talked about absurdity and he talked about humor, and there's all sorts of you know, like all the top, you know, all the kind of bullets, bullet points of his work um, that I think people miss too. I think people miss that he's kind of a funny guy. Yeah, this is a perfect start. Um, oh, hi everybody. This is a nice, chill mood, especially after last night's loss in Fight Club. I needed this kind of <laughs> dark mood. Anyway, um, this is, I think, the best place to start with you because this is the two walls that you completed um, here in Aberdeen this week. And kind of piggybacking on, I know you weren't here for the lecture this morning with Jeff, but piggybacking sort of on his conversation earlier, it's about this Found, like researching and finding found photography and sort of our lost memories and the things that we leave behind and then the ways that we reintroduce those memories into kind of like the public consciousness once again. And I know for these particular pieces, you sort of did a similar process here uh, in Aberdeen in terms of the research you did for the imageries. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what you kind of came to the conclusion that you were going to paint and like why you did that and what kind of the stories are of these works. Yeah, so... Can you hear me? Yeah. So for most of uh, well, first thank a lot for coming everybody. It's a, really a pleasure to be here. Um, most of my work, I think I try to create empathy. Uh, it being public and it being really invasive, uh, meaning it's a huge wall that is, you, you can't not look at it very similar to advertising. Um, I try to have that dialogue with uh, people that are that are passing by every day and forced to look at it. So one way of creating uh, that emotion somehow, that empathy, um, is I think through our memories and through our photography. I try to do site-specific work. Um, I say I try because it is honestly a very frivolous thing to you know travel around the world, go to a place for a day or two and then paint a huge mural and pretend that you know the place, right? Um, but within that, also I think it's interesting to have that perspective of a tourist, which is yeah. a word that I hate, but um, you can utilize it in the sense of you have an objective standpoint or maybe like a, a very filtered standpoint from my own culture or my own background onto the new thing or the new site that I'm, that I'm visiting. Um, so it's almost like, you know, when you ask a friend, like, what do you think about my song or about my piece? Because they're not in it. You get some, some outside. So from that frivolous standpoint, I think imagery is a really good reference, is a really good base. And, of course, you know, the big challenge for, for the painter, I think, is uh, to marry the taste that one has in painting uh, together with the concept and how those two can, like, fit together. So being a classical painter uh, or trying to be a classical painter, I like to find images that are appealing and old photography. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately for the new photography, which is shit compared to old <laughs> photography, um, <coughs> is really beautiful. Yeah. Really nice. Well, I think that's interesting. So in, in this particular case, like, because you are a very talented studio painter and you have that practice. <laughs> um, I do, I really enjoy your paintings. Um, but there, there's a little bit of, when you do it in the public space, there's a little bit of like, 
I don't want to say like there's the fear that you're letting the people down who live in a town if they don't appreciate it or they don't like it or they feel uncomfortable with it. Like, is there, if you're in the studio painting yourself, you don't have those, perhaps those kind of like warning signs that go off. But like when you do something like anything that you may do in public space, do you, is there like a different consciousness you have of like, okay, well, when I leave this town that I haven't been in that much and people kind of, either have positive or negative reactions. Like how is that different than your studio practice and the reactions you get from people? So this is a really nice point for me because I think two of the things that studio practice and, and outdoor practice for me are the same thing because in essence, even though they have different terminologies, maybe one is considered street art and the other one is considered contemporary art or whatever you want to call it, it's still public. Both are public. Uh, the work isn't public if I do a painting in my garage and I don't show it to anybody. Um, but I have to have, or I think we should have um, this notion and this awareness of like, who am I doing it for? I'm not saying that it can't be an introspective piece, but it, it is a form of communication somehow. So I try to attack both in the same way. The real difference is the context. So. It's not the same thing to show a series of work in a, in a gallery, which is maybe like an uptight place where a grandfather with a you know grandson will want to come in right, or yeah. will feel alienated, and um, as opposed to uh, students uh, logging or or a poor neighborhood or in the middle of the street. So um, I try to attack both in the same way, thinking of the dialogue that I'm creating with the people and the game, the play. What was your first love? <laughs> Literally, like yeah, no, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this has turned into a therapy session. Um, which okay, here we go. Yeah, um, no, I mean, like, what what was your first love? Work on the streets, or was it just uh, painting and yeah, um, painting? Uh, just the, the art of painting in general. I mean, did because I know you worked on the streets as a as a young lad. Um, so what what came first for you? Like, what was the first kind of entry point? Yeah, well, I s still consider myself a young lad. Um, <laughs> well, at last. You just made me feel old. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, but I'm, I, I think I'm weird in that sense, many, in many senses, um, because I come from a traditional family of classical painters where, you're going to love this, my great grandfather was um, uh, Enrique Dorda. He was a painter for Franco, the dictator, uh, very loved in Spain. And then my grandfather went to war as a kid, uh, say kid because he was 16. And then, just to give you some context, and then he became a painter as well. He didn't really know his grandfather much, his father much, um, but you know he looked up to him and uh, he wanted to do it. And they were both very like hyper-realistic, classical, you know, Spanish painters. Um, and then my father joined the Communist Party just to mix things in. And, uh, and uh, he, was, he was a wild child, but he was also into art in different ways and also into drawing. And then on my grandmother's side, she, she's Haitian, and she'd do these memories of Haiti where um, she would paint Haiti uh, from, from her, her thoughts. And kind of try to like revisit this melancholic thought. So I was raised around this environment in Andalusia, which is, well, going back and forth from Miami and Andalusia, which is classically like, you know, Sorolla, Velázquez, a lot of painters were from there, Picasso as well. Um, so I was in, around this environment since an early age, and that was, I guess, the earliest, like the first love, um, just classical drawing. But, um, very early as well, at, at the age of 12, I started to do graffiti. Um, and mind that, I don't know, I have an odd, odd relationship with hip hop. I, I feel like the true or my true uh, relationship with hip hop is not the hip hop that we know, like from the 70s, 80s in the States. Uh, we would get it through, I would have to literally like take my bike, put it in a train, go to another town, then like go to this like little graffiti shop where the people were really hostile <laughs> to us, like toy kids and uh, buy some magazine and like maybe get some piece of information from someone and like see what, what they were doing and then come back to the city and every day we were in the newspaper because nobody was doing that it was just weird um so marrying those two together which are 
I guess a tough cookie as well. Um, I kind of found this like love, I guess. It yeah. was it was the the consensus between that classical painting and the thought be- be behind the concept of maybe like Murillo's paintings of coming back to the studio and doing like portraits of these kids that uh, that live around him as opposed to painting like fucking royalty or whoever. Yeah, well that's interesting because you mentioned that your grandfather did art for propaganda purposes. Yeah. But what ends up happening with a lot of art that's made for propaganda purposes is that it, it, it tries to make the country people feel strong about kind of their identity and that it kind of gets into this almost kind of middle, I don't say middle class, kind of the bad term, but it it's, does kind of a manipulation of like what it means to be kind of a proud, uh, just kind of common person. Yeah. And you do kind of an interesting thing where you're actually doing a similar thing about kind of focusing on a little bit more of the mundane or kind of like the people that are not necessarily the, the royalty that you yeah. say that is, who you paint. So it's kind of a weird reaction that you have towards like propaganda painting that you're sort of doing in like some kind of like some of the really, really nice kind of traditional portrait painters of America after yeah. World War II kind of did the same thing. Like American Gothic being like a very good example of just like this very simple couple um, so like, it, it's weird that you kind of have this reaction to kind of focus on those, I don't say those people, but that kind of, um, the, the people that you choose to portray is it's unique. Yeah. I think it all, a lot of it comes from my context. I think I'm thankful to, to be coming from this eclectic mix of, uh, both like my mom is like part of the new Black Panther party. My dad in, in the, in the communist party was, and then like extreme fascists on the on my grandfather's side um as well as like the way that they were raised i feel like there's always this precession in generations and how they change and i think that made me find this like dichotomy and trying to bring in the little bits and pieces and curate the things of both that i enjoyed i don't really consider myself like on one side or another yeah, yeah. and i think that's one of the mistakes that maybe uh, closer to to my history in Spain that we've done, you know, it's like oh, it's, it's fascist, it's bad, and you shouldn't look at it, or even like think about you know putting up the statues. Um, but uh, if it's uh, if it's not, then it's good and and it's absolute, you know. And having this like absolute as opposed to relative uh, thought process, I try to do that in my work um, in a very anarchic way, not in the sense of like you know non-government or non-structure, but like free trying to really do introspection and see what it is that I'm interested in and what are the things that I really truly enjoy from like for example Murillo or Velasquez uh, coming and putting himself in the same painting in the Meninas with the royalty um, being a painter considered like low class uh, or the I don't know classical work of Sorolla who was more like a commission job painter no and then marry that with graffiti with this like act of rebellion but then again this really like retrograde and <laughs> retarded like you know adults that didn't grow up kind yeah, of, yeah, like, yeah thing so trying to get the bits and pieces that i like yeah but like we we talked about i and i hate doing this i'm sorry we talked about this yesterday when nobody was here uh, um you but you do have a sense of humor and I think like people don't. I think there you you could get it can get lost, but like you do have like a little bit. And you were talking about play, just the the idea of having a little bit of fun with this stuff. Because like you can look at the work and it looks very dark, but there's like you have like little, you you have a funny side, and there's a little bit of a humorous side to your practice as well. But is that like a misreading of it? I mean, I think you're pretty funny. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Um, you think it's more more so that you you have subtle humor that you're kind of you're not. That does, that shouldn't go unnoticed. Yeah, the way I am, I, I always shoot the shit. Like I like to, I'm, I'm a bit of a troublemaker. Like I enjoy yeah. this, maybe like Andalusian street rap behavior. I I don't like to lose that somehow. Um, and I do have humor in my work. It's so serious though, and so like yeah. this most of the times yeah. that I feel like people for the most part, is just overtaking by, like, the strong imagery or whatever it is. But um, I think the people that are interested in reading, and maybe that's another discussion that's interesting, like, there's different there's different levels of reading of one work, no? and different depths, maybe. Mm-hmm. And um, maybe, like, you know, from the whatever followers or whatever people that see the work, 
maybe it's just like a two or three percent but a, a worthy two or three percent that are like hey like you know i'm actually reading the text and like what is what is it saying and how is it coming through like in the image of, that i did here and everything like putting together the the image on the on the right the wall on the right is a visitation of a of the queen everybody's going to see the queen kind of like hysterically and um the image on the left is a hula hoop competition <laughs> uh and just like the dialogue between those two works it is i guess a very sarcastic humor oh, but yeah for sure if you and then you, think fl- of you it, flip like, the photo or over it's just, just all these little parts of it where it's like really yeah. funny and like the faces of the people in the, in the mural like there's this kind of like a little bit of like this kind of silly sort of it's like these people are like this adoration of like what are these people looking at actually yeah. you know it's like it's really it's but you um and we totally we totally messed up we were going to try to encourage people to ask us questions throughout yeah. we forgot to say that if you have a question like midway through while we actually are talking about it and you feel like you really want to say something please raise your hand and we'll, we'll even if you don't really want if to you don't really want to see yeah exactly kind of um but you wait you write a lot i mean you write a lot about your work like you're you you were saying how you actually don't mind being very explicit about what you're doing and so, like so i mean that comes with a little bit of confidence but also comes with like why do you want to do that you it seems as if it's not necessarily what an artist always does yeah so i think empathy is the word it's like okay. creating that empathy is the goal at least for for me not really putting my thought or my opinion in their head but having them go through the thought process. Like, if we were gonna visualize it, I wanna build walls, and within there is like a margin of interpretation, but I want those walls or that avenue to be very wide. But I do want it to have a direction. I don't want people to just randomly see the red painting and be like, oh, is this about period blood or communism? Um, I want them to kind of have like a, a direction that they can take, and that creates the empathy, I think, with the work. So, I, I try to like put those two together in a way that I don't know I guess I see it like when when people are are viewing the work I want them to take something something home not just have like a beautiful display of like technique or or have this more like frivolous sense of like maybe street art is whereas uh, oh it's cool because you know he used the tree as the, an afro of the, the character or what, whatever clever thing is. <laughs> it becomes a little frivolous and superficial for me. I'm trying to find this like this this uh communion between depth and not being condescending with the audience and not like trying to dumb it down for them to understand. Like populist or popular is not is not a synonymous of stupid really. Or not all the time. Do you are you worried at all that street art because it's become so popular, is becoming less and less of the right platform for you to talk about the things that you want to talk about? So my platform is not street art. I feel like my platform is the wall and the street and the people that are there. Street art is a term, and I like terms because if not, we wouldn't understand each other. But I feel like we often forget that terms are in our service and not the other way around. Uh, When we define, you know, table, it's like bring the table for, for, for you to know what the hell I'm talking about. But then we have this um, this odd need to like to represent with abstraction things. I hope I'm not being too weird. To represent with abstraction in the sense of like, well, what is a table and what is the meaning of the table? And going so far in the research where we, we lost like the original intent of the action. And I think both are really healthy practices, like having this like innate nature with what the thing is, like art, what does it make you feel pretty much? That's it. Um, but doesn't mean like good and then I go home it means like well what is that good and how you bring it out and there I think abstraction is useful but um, otherwise I I think getting lost in either one is is dangerous and I think street art does that I think street art gets lost in maybe too much on the side of like the innate feeling of like cool like this is like bubblegum I like tastes strong at the beginning but then it's like pointless and it's still plastic in your mouth you know because I'm running about filming everything, I never get to really embrace the uh, academic side, yeah, the, yeah, the New yeah, Art yeah. Plus program. So what for you, did you get to, to see much and what for you was any, other, apart from the conversation that we've just heard with Axel, yeah. uh, was there anything else that kind of stood out for you? Well, you know, what actually is really interesting is that we all get invited to do this. Kind of, like a couple of us get invited every single year. And what I, what I love about it is that there's some of us who are really uncomfortable about speaking in public. 
myself included. Like we all have gotten more confident, makes it like so much more enjoyable because I feel like it's like we're all supporting each other. Uh, Jeff Farrell's lecture conversation that he did about dumpster diving and found photography and the things that we leave behind was one of the best talks I think New Art's ever had. He was fantastic. He's a professor, I believe at Texas Christian in Dallas. Um, and I, I, you know, I, Susan Hansen, who, who runs the New Art Plus program, I talked about him and she's like, Evan, you're really going to like this. Martin, who was really excited about it, but I'd never heard him speak before, but I kind of read a little bit that he'd done. He was so good. And it was just like, it was so illuminating because we, he's not been part of this family, but all of a sudden it was like, oh no, you, you get it. He, like, he was so perfectly curated. It was like, oh, you're, you're, you've got the vibe that we all have. Like you, you are intelligent about it. You have got a little sense of humor, but you also are you know, dead set on, on dedicating your life to this kind of underground art form. And there's some people who are just so natural to explain their concepts. And he, it was almost like, I've never heard somebody so natural speak for 25 minutes without any notes, you know, it was so it was brilliant. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that you, I, I'll take away. I'm like, I wrote down so many notes during his, during his talk that I'm going to juxtapose readers. You're going to like see his concepts <laughs> in my writing now for another year, you know? And I feel the same way about Carlo McCormick when he's here. Like, I just like, these guys are so brilliant. Um, and Susan herself, like these people who've dedicated their lives to stuff. Like I just, I love hearing them talk because I feel like I learned so much and I, and I gotta be honest, I borrow their ideas and that's the way it should be. Does this, um, for you then become kind of like a, a, a chance for you to then shape what oh, content you, you'll be putting out in the future? Yeah. Or, and I, I definitely feel like this is like both new art festivals. It's kind of like my recharger of some certain concepts that I like to apply to the way we cover street art or just, you know, the way I look at art in general, you know, not just street art. All my life, since I was a teenager, uh, I've been a dumpster diver or a skip diver, a trash picker. Um, I still do that daily uh, when I'm when I'm back in the States uh, for all sorts of reasons. It certainly animates my life with surprise. Uh, I do it on a bicycle and so you never know what you're going to roll up on, what you're going to find in the trash. I do it also because, as I'm sure you're aware, not, certainly here, but especially in the U.S., so much gets thrown away. Uh, I make weekly or monthly runs to the homeless shelters or the food bank with all the clothes I find, the tools, the food. So it's a real sort of stealing from the rich and giving to the poor in a way that you don't, at least don't often uh, get arrested. Uh, so there's all sorts of reasons that I enjoy dumpster diving. But again, one thing it taught me especially was to think in new terms about the spaces of the city and about the temporal layout of the city. Uh, let me start with the spaces. To be, to be a trash picker is always to occupy the backstage, never the front stage. Uh, you're never on the sidewalk, you're in the alley. You're not going in the front door of a store, you're loitering around the back door of the store uh, near the trash bins. Uh, you're always retracing a map of the city that involves staying out of sight of the police and security guards and security cameras. You learn how to uh, uh, hit dumpsters or trash bins at different times depending on who's there or when the shop closes or when people are at work. So you remap, you unmap the city and then remap it as a series of shadowy encounters, a series of uh, drifts down alleys, uh, a map of possibilities and closed off possibilities. You learn to look up for windows that are occupied and over here for surveillance cameras and down the alley for uh, security guards, sometimes more or less successfully. But again, you live in the backstage, you live in the shadows, and often you find in those shadows new kinds of community, new kinds of possibility. Also, I learned from being a dumpster diver to live in lag time. Uh, problems get solved eventually, but not immediately. Uh, anything you need, you will find unless you're trying to find it, in which case you won't. <laughs> so again, you learn to sort of live behind your own needs. You learn to put aside the immediacy of desire and wait for the universe to make the first move. On another level, you live behind other people's lives because you're not there for the festival. You're there after the festival closes to scrounge the aluminum cans that are left behind. You find last Christmas's gifts in the summer that follows when the kids wear, wear out their pleasure with them or when people throw away their clothes. So you find winter clothes in summer and summer clothes in winter. You're always a season or two behind, a cycle or two of consumption behind the rhythms of society. So that again, I've literally realized in, in my life as a dumpster driver and writing a book about this, that as much as it's a matter of uh, pulling goods out of the waste stream, it's also a matter of rethinking who you are in, in terms of time and space to embrace a sort of a zen, I would say, of almost killing your ego, killing your sense of immediate need and desire and drifting behind and below and in the spaces other people forget are the spaces that are left behind. Now, another aspect of dumpster diving uh, or trash picking is that over these 
now many decades of doing this, I've accumulated thousands and thousands of discarded photos. So in among the old clothes and the tools and the food, you find old photo albums, uh, when, often tragically there. You realize, again, as a dumpster diver, you can piece the story together. Someone passed away, so here are the goods of an older person who passed away and their old photos. Couples break up, and when they break up, they tend to throw away the photos of the partner they now despise. Uh, I've literally found photos torn in half, so uh, he's gone, and so is his half of the photo. She kept her half of it. Um, when, uh, when people move, or are forced to move, or, or uh, change occupations, or change residences, again, images of their lives get lost. So these photos then are interred in the trash. They are not meant to be seen again. They're at the bottom of trash bags. They're in old suitcases, old files buried in the trash. My job, in a sense, is to disinter them or, since Easter is tomorrow, uh, to resurrect them, to give them new life and to pull them from the trash stream, save them from their, their uh, condemnation or damnation in the uh, trash bin and onward into the landfill. But also what you realize, and perhaps you're ahead of me, is this creates some serious curatorial problems uh, because what do you do with thousands of found photos? Do you now have a responsibility for them? Uh, I feel like I need to save them once I've found them, which I, maybe is a strange impulse, but I, once I realize those photos are there, I feel a compassion and a compulsion to pull them out of the trash and give them a sort of new life. And so, as you can see in these photos, many of them old photos, many decades old, memories of people's lives, lost parts of who they were or who their relationships were about that now become part of my life and fill my closets and my uh, files and my desk with these photos. So these photos, again, are in many ways, again, uh, in lag time. They are the history of people's lives. They're the past that perhaps they've forgotten or their children forgot or that they no longer uh, wish to be a part of. And then they become part of the lives of those who find them. And I now, I suppose, become their owner or their uh, guardian. And so, as again, you can see uh, some of these photos. You have a different position at these things because I'm the, I, get, I get to kind of like – listen to the talks, mm -hmm. get my talks and you kind of be, but you have to like go up on the list with people. Like you're like, you're like next to the artist. Like, that's not what I do here. What do you see? Like when these, like at these that, things for me, one of my highlights was definitely getting a chance to stand in and, and just spend time with Veals and his, and his mini team. Cause they're all, you know, he's an absolute diamond. He's a super, super lovely guy. guy. Yeah. He, re he really is. Yeah. And, all uh, his, and all the guys that work with him are special guys. Really, really nice. Um, which which makes a difference when you're when you're trying to you know trying to approach someone trying to work with someone and do things like that. So it was really cool. He was very open. He was like, look, let's make time for the interview and things like that. So I really liked his project where he. I mean, he's gonna talk about this. You're gonna hear him talk about it better than me butchering. You know what he's actually recreated, and it kind of goes to what you were saying with Axel earlier. It's that idea of look, how can I come into someone else's space and not just bring my ego yeah, yeah. you know it's like how can i bring something that's genuinely going to make or at least try to present a, a, some kind of connection uh that people from here will be able to relate to and take something away from and i think he did that incredibly well i guess the best quickest way to start this is can you maybe just explain uh the story of of how how you found these people and who these people that you've created on this wall, who, who they are. Okay, so basically we I had an invitation from Martin from a long time ago to come to, to North Aberdeen to do something. And um, I managed to do it this year. And as soon as I saw the wall, I saw that it was, you know, an amazing, almost like a portal to something that brings you to, to, uh, to the past. And... Uh, I wanted to respect that. I didn't want to go and you know paint everything white and then carve and reveal what was in the need, which is usually is like something I do. I wanted to kind of keep the intact, the texture and everything that was kind of uh, bringing you a little bit of a little of, uh, bit of, of of the past of, of all these layers that were laying down on on the wall. So I did a bit of research. Uh, and I, you know, I found a little bit about the city, about you know the relation with granite and and and, and the relation to the sea that the the, the the city had, and I found this story of um, uh, this this uh, this person that was kind of uh, in in the thirties, um, part of the anti-fascist brigade brigades that went to 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 Spain, 
uh, and his kind of relation with uh, Spanish uh, seamen, where they kind of got got together to kind of push for 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 better rights and and and, and better conditions at work. And it's in a time of Brexit that we are living in, and if Europe and the world is questioning, you know, well, should we be in touch? Should we kind of push forward, kind of? Um, uh, things together, or should we get close and so on? So, so it, I kind of really find this story very relevant uh, as a kind of when you get together, you 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 have much more, you are much stronger than than uh, you know fighting by yourself by yourself for yourself. So, so it was something that really touched me. It's in the thirties, so and you actually achieve uh, uh, something. Uh, but then it came the big crisis and so on as well. And everything was destroyed. But anyway, it was just a story that it was very interesting to see how cooperation between different people, different uh, regions can really push for better, better, a better tomorrow. And and in the times we live in, where we kind of put that in question, it's I think it was a relevant story to bring back through a wall that looks like. Um, a portal to the past. What is it you look for then when you're going through these? Because, you know, I imagine this wasn't the only story that you found. Uh, you know, you look at a, a city that's hundreds and hundreds of years old. What is it that you look for um, when you're doing this research? Because you have such a, sh a short amount of time when you're able to come in and, and, and begin and, and create and, and engage with this, this city and this process. What is it that kind of stands out for you while you're doing this? I think it's it's a story that uh, kind of resonates with the present. I try to bring something back from like uh, from the past. So, and even if we had like two days to create the wall and to do everything, it's kind of the production mode. But I was doing research for almost a month to get like to the story, to work on the sketch and so on. Um, but it's I think the you know it really depends on the city, it depends on the project I bring to the city. This is a new project that I'm trying to bring, which is something that kind of brings the past to the present. Uh, but it's the, the the decision making on choosing the subject is usually how that uh, event or person from the past relates to the times we live in. And here, um, you know, it's a very particular time we live in, and it was kind of relevant to bring that story back. Regarding the surface of the wall, what what is it that sort of because that you toyed with with drilling and things like this and uh, what is it for you that that helps guide that part of your process is it a physical thing or is it uh like a, the actual you know how sound is this structure am i going to suddenly give these guys you know a conservatory or is it for you something more aesthetic in how you want to present this final image uh it's it's a bit of both um i never know how a wall is going to be because you never know how they were built um I found like very strange things inside walls, um, but but it, it's kind of a dance with the chaos because you never know what you're gonna find, how, str how strong it is. Sometimes it's very strong, sometimes it's very soft. So you have an image in your head, you kind of project where it's gonna be and everything, and then as soon as you're gonna break, you need to really feel the wall and kind of. If it breaks too much, you include it in the drawing. If it's not possible to break, you 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 incorporate the sub, like the the area that is impossible to break. It's kind of a um, a process of kind of creation that it's really uh, I never know the final results. So I have an image in my head. I know where I'm going to break, but I never know how it's going to look in the end. And th and I think that's the the thing that makes the work very uh, peculiar to or or very. Um, it relates to the space uh, very. Um, uh, it, it, it's it's kind of part of the fabric of the place where it's done. So it's really, it can be the same the same image. If I did it in another city, it will be completely different because the layers will be different because the past of that city, the the process of of building the walls in that city is different on every city. So it's kind of a it's it's a work that really adapts to the place and to the the story of the place. Um, so what what is going through your head while you're doing this? It's difficult. Uh, it's a problem solving. Method. I think it's like, how can we uh, incorporate this part of the building without you know bringing too much, bringing too little? But it's really, I don't know. It's like, it's like a very fluid 
process. So we were talking yesterday and you kind of mentioned that you had been to Scotland before and that you were possibly going to go end up at Glasgow School of Art and you ended up at Central St. Martins. And I, as soon as you said that, I, 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 all I could think was if that had happened, would we still know veals in the way that we know veals today? So do you think, do you, I know it's an impossible, so had you kind of begun this, this process of kind of going down the path that you were at or to what degree was, was London and that time there kind of, did that change your direction in some way? We have, I, I have no idea. I think we are a succession of, you know, chaotic uh, things that happen in our lives that bring us where we are now. Um, but for sure, uh, it was a moment, a particular moment in London that was kind of vibrant at the time. Talking about 2007, 2008, it was a lot of things happening. And it was a very peculiar time for the movement and 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 they influenced me a lot. Though Scotland and, and the school, that's, uh, which was amazing, it would have been amazing as well to do it. So, but I don't really know how to answer that question. Yeah, it's funny. Um, and then, kind of going into London, um, I don't know if to what extent you can talk about this and, and and whether or not it's happened before. But I know that there was a project in London that you had just finished in Portobello. I just I found that kind of mad. You had finished the wall. You, uh, but it was hidden, so it was kind of like not publicly yeah. known that this wall had been created. So you had created this piece for this bar, I think it was, yeah. and then a series of events happened where it yeah. got yeah. shut down. Has that ever happened to you before at that, that, that stage? And can you maybe just tell me a little bit about yeah. what happened there? <laughs> no, I mean, we, we were asked to, you know, to uh, do a project, uh, which we did. Um, but it's you know it's of, it's often when when you work in public space and and it's it's weird to see like a city as um, as London that has so much it was so important for the whole movement that it's you know seems to be struggling sometimes with projects with artists in the public space um, and with so many concerns that we have about you know uh, art and all these subjects as when advertising it's it's not even question it in 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 so many ways so but it's i you know it never happened it was kind of the first time but uh, but um you know i understand you know like it's it's it's, it's also the um, everyone has the right to 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 kind of to their opinion and and we try, i i did everything in my power to make it like a very um transparent process and and, and and to propose everything before and approval and all that. And, you know, I don't know how it's going to be, but it just it was a project that I tried to, to give, uh, to, to do. And do you think then that there's a degree of your style that, because, that, you, you know, the way that you talk, you, have, you research your, your characters and there's a, a sensitivity that you have towards the area. Do you think people find it hard to see, see the sensitivity and the actual engagement that you're going through in your practice because of things like, seeing jackhammers on the sides of walls, do you think that throws people in some way? It suddenly becomes like more destructive that they see it rather than something else? Yeah, I don't know, maybe. Uh, uh, the, the, well, the, the idea of the work is really to kind of subvert the idea of uh, destruction. So it's actually the opposite of destruction. It's, of course, it's destroying, but every creation destroys something, implies a, a destruction. Um, of something that was there before, you, you know, even a marble cube that you carve and you break to create a sculpture, it's you're destroying a cube, you know, and you start, you're taking from the land. So it's 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 kind of the, the the idea of the process and how it's done and how it's kind of engraved and visual and it reveals the insides of the buildings and so on. It's it's really to try to make a relation with 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 something that it's inside those walls and inside of that area. So. So yeah, maybe that that's maybe the reason, or maybe you know people just um, don't like it or don't want to be exposed to it, and it's okay. You know, everyone has the right to their opinion. Um, and then you, just finally, you kind of—I I mean, my personal experience—you you continue to engage with London again and again, um, and you know, as a Londoner, thank you for that. Um, but it, because I I feel like 
from where I sit, there's less and less of that engagement coming in and people really kind of trying to make it back like it was in 2007. Mm -hmm. You know, there was there, there was an energy there and it feels like there's there's less. Where do you see now that has that same energy that London had in 2007? <clears throat> As a man of the world. <laughs> no, I mean, I, 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 I lived in London for seven years, so it, it was, it, it's, a, it's a place that will be always very close to, to my heart, and, and it, it's really a vibrant place where things, you know, bubble and, and, and come up. You know, I'm very grateful for being there at the time. Uh, though it's like, it's normal. It's things go and come and go, and, but I, I think, you know, like there's lots so many things interesting I mean, even artists from London that are doing stuff every, uh, elsewhere, um, but it's 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 um, it's always kind of moved from city to city. I think you always have kind of this, like London was. It's it's still very relevant, but it was very important at the time. And then we start to get Paris a lot of things, and then Berlin it was very very strong, and then Madrid, Lisbon it was kind of strong as well. And but n now you see so many things like. Miami was very strong as well. Havana is doing a lot of things in public space as well, which is which in the biennial that they had, and, and and it's 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 amazing to see things popping up there. So Mexico, it's I mean it's the it's it seems it seems to be interesting because every year you have like a f like s several few artists that are really pushing. You know their techniques, their limits, on on and pop, pop up. You know, it's, it seems to be renovating each the 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 uh, with with new new people doing, you know, new things, fresh things, uh, and and you we could see that in the last few years, and that's um, that's in interesting to see. And it's also, but it's but it's, I in my feeling, I think London was kind of the first. Uh, place that really pushed and, and the shockwave is kind of going in different places but um, you know it's also the first movement that it didn't start really on a one city it was with the internet at the time people could be everywhere in the world and you kind of had always you know it was the first movement that didn't have the bird city it was the the bird was in different so many uh, places um, but definitely I think London was kind of like the kickoff Seeing, uh, final question, seeing all these people, um, you know, constantly doing new things, you've been in, in this scene for, for quite a while now. Do you feel pressure in yourself to kind of continue to reimagine and reinvent your practice and to kind of to keep moving forward? Uh, well, it's the team of what I really love to do is to push myself to do things, new things and challenge myself. So it's really part of the process of creation for me. So it's not really. I feel the pressure. It's like it's part of the process itself. Uh, though I'm trying to like take it slower, you know, concentrate more on 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 things, having more time to each each project, um, you know, trying to you know enjoy a little bit more uh, the, the 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 processes, even if you know sometimes it's complicated. But but well, it's it's kind of uh, I've been I have a few things that I'm working on that will come up in the next few years that are kind of it's, it's it's the continuation of the practice that I've been doing so but it's it's really uh, answering to your question like it's 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 really what drives me to do what I do it's pushing things and try to do new techniques new processes discover new stories and you know giving space to them in the cities that I go and work one last question. Sorry, I said that last one was going to be the last one, but I got so many. I could go on for days, but no, wait, uh, genuinely the last question. Um, w one thing that I've found with people that have kind of gone through into into the upper echelons of of, of the street scene, into c breaking through into the into just contemporary art, how do you feel about being referred to as a street artist? Does that label in any way annoy or bother you? Do you feel that it devalues really what you're doing or do you feel comfortable with it and, it and it just is what it is i mean i always had problems with street art as a word though people need to find a way to 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 kind of um label these artists and, and so on and and but street art is a bit you know it's generic and, and it's kind of it pushes you in a corner though yeah, we work in a public space. We have no, sh I mean, I have no shame about it. And it, eighty percent of my practice is outside, and I'm very proud about it. Um, 
and the rest of my practice is inside. But I work with galleries from contemporary art worlds uh, and that have nothing to do with the movement. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it's they, they set me as an artist that works in a public space. Nobody questions a contemporary artist if, if uh, you know, if they do 80% of their work indoors and for selling and and galleries, it's uh, it's not nobody raises the question. You know why? You just you, are you a you know a, a studio artist or <laughs> and we are street artist. You know it doesn't. It's a, it's a label that really I think reduces a lot of the talent that this movement has because a lot of artists they do as relevant work inside as they do outside, and it shouldn't be how artists are. Labeled, I think art is art. Artists are doing create, creating things, and the, sh the label that puts them, you know, in the street is is a label that's it's 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 true to their practice, but it's it's really in the art world, in the contemporary art world, it can really reduce them, the the opportunities and the projects and the the, um, the things that they can do, and and for a long time I struggled with that, and I think a lot of artists did. Today I don't really care, and I just do my thing. Also for me, just finding out about, like, I didn't really know the work of, I'm going to butcher your name. I'm sorry, man. You, oh, by the way, I'm just going to say, this is the best looking dude I've ever seen in my life. Julio Anaya. <laughs> Cab <laughs> Doug's been waiting to say that. Julio Anaya Cabanding from, from Spain. Spain. I mean, that's how I would say it. So what he's doing is taking, you know, old masters paintings and classical paintings and putting them in just fully recreating them on the surfaces in the most like sh shitty environments like just places you like w how did you even find this his rembrandt over here in the tunnels just like, it, oh, are you kidding me it's, yeah, so, it's like, so good there's needles condoms everywhere you're just like oh cool there's a money i don't understand okay can i just can I throw something out real quick yeah why are there needles and condoms together all the time Shoot up and you want to fuck, but you want to do it protected because you're right. slightly safety conscious. I brought this up at, like, at a pub conversation earlier this week and no one had an answer. Let's go back to the art. Yeah, I, 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 don't, know, I don't know where we're going to go on that one. I'm drinking a pint. It's feeling good. That was a, that was a, a real cool moment and I, I wasn't so aware of his work. And I yeah. think for me, it's like, it's like, you know, a mural looks good and you can just look at it and you can see wider context of the picture. And you can get a sense of it, but when you're looking at something as small and intimate in a space that really is, you know, it's all the nuances around you, mm -hmm. like the needles and the condoms, the empty beer cans in the tunnel, and then you suddenly find this thing of like old school heritage of, of really refined beauty, you just, that's the way that you're supposed to appreciate that art. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're not supposed to appreciate that art through an Instagram right. page. Yeah, and it's like, you know, and especially that particular Rembrandt piece is like you leave the club and you're kind of walking back. You've probably had a couple of drinks or whatever, and then you go, you're going by and like it's just so dingy. And all of a sudden you kind of look to your right and you're like, is that a Rembrandt in the corner? And that's like, there's something so out of context yet so perfectly like illuminating at the same time. It's so nice. It was cool too because like I went up to shout out to the Kafka boys at the shop up the street. I went up to the shop earlier this week and was just kind of checking out some whatever, some stuff. And um, they were like, hey, you know, because they know me now because I've been here three years. And they're like, hey, can I show you this art I took a photo of the other day? Like, is this part of new art? And they, they sent me a photo of Evil's work. And it was kind of, you know, because it's like he did like the kind of the, the council estate kind of style on, the, you know, on a, I don't know what they call those. Ele electrical boxes. Okay, yeah, okay, right. It's the same as they call them in the U.S. I like that you, you got council estate, yeah. but you couldn't get electrical box. <laughs> You were doing so well. <laughs> um, but they were like, oh, is it? Is this part, this is like, the, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I'm like, oh, that's cool. These guys who live in town, who kind of now know New has been here, they like, they found like, kind of like the subtle, like little hidden evil work that was like around town. They were like, this is so cool. And I, like, that's the part I was kind of like, oh yeah, like those, the little pieces that you see as opposed to the murals. Murals are great too, but like the little stuff is like the ones I think everyone's kind of like, Oh, I saw that. Okay, like, and they feel like a little bit more connected. That's definitely the, the that's part of that experience of when you come to these towns and then you see that like you, you know, I just think anyone that's doing a mural festival, you are completely missing out on that trick. Yeah. You know, that real human scale 
pull people in and capture their and, attention. And Martin Reed in New York is like so – they keep that going. Yeah. They'll never just do murals. They'll always do like the little things. Just like to point out, by the way, we haven't been paid by New Art. No, 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 no. Actually, like, not at all. I, 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 maybe we should have declared that at the start. <laughs> like, I'm here. I'm here uh, on a job, but this isn't. We haven't been paid no. to do this. We haven't been. We haven't been told to say anything. Like, this is just a genuine conversation. We actually like it, and yeah. it's like it isn't. Yeah, it's not about publicizing anything we're not supposed to, or what we, or we're, we're being forced to. It's like yeah. we actually just really like the program and like the, you know, the contrasting. Of Big and small. So what is it? And you kind of touched on this earlier. It always, you know, you take Jeff, for example, who's never been a part of the new art family. Yeah. And he t comes in and it just suddenly feels like everyone here just suddenly feels like they're part of something. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, it's, what is that? I think because like new art is the, like, the one festival where it's a little reckless and a little rebellious, but also very like organized. <laughs> Like it's, it's like it's, there's a real weird mix of like they have it they have a bit of chaos but they also kind of like keep it structured enough where like all of us who they invite tend to like the little bit of the chaos but also kind of like to be told where to be at what time and like i feel like that's and then like it's the spirit of it kind of rubs off immediately for people who are ready to go with it and i think that's why we feel comfortable enough to be like this place is really cool and what they do in norway and scotland is something we want to come back to because there's like it's like very, very serious laughter, you know, at all times. And I love that.